to see if it's working. Looks like we might be working, but it's not working on my end here. There we go. How's everybody doing today? Having some technical difficulties, bear with us. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and start and let me know in the comments if you're having audio problems. If, it, if you hear everything fine, just let me know. Oh man, hopefully, I'm not sure how long this stream's going to go. It was kind of a slow week, kind of not a slow week. It just kind of depends. So um, welcome to the show. Um, I'm Derek and this is Colin over here. I actually have the, the uh, windows properly this time. So it looks like we're looking at each other since I have two different screens. We are looking at each other finally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Good to> see. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about this week's space news. Um, there's one or two big items that happened this week. Um, uh, and a few smaller items, but not a whole lot. But in the next couple of weeks, it's just going to start ramping up as we get closer toward the Artemis 1, uh, uncrewed Artemis 1 mission. Um, so let's see if um, before we begin go ahead and uh, give us a follow um at orbital velocity let's see at orbital uh vel on twitter and he's uh what is your uh, twitter handle colin yeah it's just at cullen deforge uh last name we'll spelled d-e-s-f-o-r-g-e-s -E yeah, we'll have to actually put that on the actual on the uh on the window at some point so soon maybe next time yeah, there we go. we're still we're just we're still working working out everything here and of course, my personal uh, Twitter is at the Space Writer on Twitter. And of course, be sure to follow uh, Orbital Velocity uh, on YouTube if you haven't already. If you're new, welcome. Um, and of course, I also make videos semi-regularly on this on this channel. My plan is to have another video out this week over the Capstone mission. I've got several scripts already written coming down the line. So it's one on the Capstone mission going to the moon, and uh, one over the Commercial Lunar Payload Services program that'll come out probably in a week and uh, in two about two weeks from now so not this week but next week that's my goal and uh shortly after that depending on how what is going on with artemis one i may have a tv animation for uh the artemis one mission and of course then i'll have a video over artemis one itself as we get closer to the launch so but enough of that for now we'll go ahead and go go and in, go into this week's news uh and really the big thing that happened this week um started off at the beginning of the week but and that was Russia, the news anyway, that Russia was actually going to be leaving the International Space Station program. Now, there was a lot of uh, a lot in the news about how it was a done deal. This is going to happen. But the first thing I saw when I see, saw all that stuff was, first of all, it was the new guy in town, the the uh, new Rus head of the Russian space program, Yuri Borisov. He's pretty much trying to make, you know, get his voice out there and, uh, um, you know, he's basically assert his dominance, I suppose, for lack of a better phrase there. But basically, he went on to state media and said, yeah, we're going to leave after the ISS program after 2024. And, you know, that got the Western media all up in a tizzy. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're not familiar with how all this stuff works, it makes sense. It's just kind of weird. But the key word was after 2024. And right now, everybody's planning on technically leaving after 2024, including the United States. The pro thing is, 2025 is after 2024, 2026 is after 2024, in our case, 2030 is after 2024. And I do believe um, Roscosmos or, or Borisov came out later and said, we did have an emphasis on the after part of that sentence. So they are, will be leaving after 2024, but they, the real news in that, in my opinion, was not the fact that they were planning on leaving, which we all expect to happen at some point. Um, the real news, in my opinion, is just there's some more details about the Russian, um, the, the follow-on space station that Russia wants to build. And they don't want to actually leave um, the ISS program until the, uh, um, drawing a blank here, they don't want to leave the ISS program until after uh, they at least get the beginnings of their space station done. At least that's what they're saying. I still say show me the money on that one. I'm going to try to find a picture of it here for you real soon. Is there anything you want to add to that initial thought, Colin, while I'm looking for a picture? Yeah, um, just to kind of piggyback off of what you're saying, I do think it's important to uh, really think about why this announcement came about uh, and what exactly was said. Like you said, they, they really kind of put a uh, – it was very vague as far as the announcement goes after 2024. Um, this is something that I think kind of had to happen with the change in leadership, um, you know, being that, um, you know, uh, you know, kind of, you know, staying from an apolitical standpoint here um, for Russia, you know, their their state media is is kind of all about news. 
and uh, you know, kind of getting things moving and shaking. So whenever uh, we see this change in leadership, I think they had to, um, for lack of a better term, I mean, I think they just kind of wanted to, to um, shake things up, really. Uh, you know, because if you look at NASA leadership, um, you know, they they didn't hear anything. Uh, that, that's that's kind of that's that's something that's I you know I think is 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 really a big deal. You know these these major these major um, news outlets were really reporting. Hey, you know Russia is leaving after 2024. They're leaving. They're done. Um, but NASA said, hey, this is kind of the first we're hearing of this. There's no there's no official official word. Oh, I forgot to um, the NASA side of things. Yeah, and, and the thing is, you, you know, uh, Zarya, the Russian, uh, you know, Zarya is 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 technically owned by the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not really in a position to, uh, you know, if they if they did want to leave this, you know, the space station, I don't know how that what that would look like uh, from from that point of view. Um, so I, I do think that there's, you know, this is not this, this, we, I think it's very important to avoid a knee jerk reaction to um, this, this statement here. Um, I personally don't think that we'll see anything uh, again until the agreement in 2028. Um, at best really uh yeah. kind of to piggyback of what you're saying show me the money yeah. that's 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 really what i i think is yeah. the, the, the important space thing program here. has been cash strapped for decades um of course slightly, uh, mildly that's pretty much <laughs> they've also got some <laughs> priorities going on right now in, in their yeah. budget anyway so well it, it really is a just bunch of uh, chest thumping basically so they're they're not leaving in 2024 barring some significant reason why there's a safety re say there's a safety reason why they can't stay there so if there's and now to be fair uh the two oldest modules zarya and zvezda are you know gosh they're 24 and 22 years old i think respectively or the older yeah well and that the older one was from 1998 and, uh, and it's, yeah and then uh, zvezda was from uh, um 2000 2000. I think that's another good point. You know, uh, I, I mean, it, it does kind of bring up the the argument or idea of, you know, for those that don't know, Zvezda is really what controls the guidance, navigation, and, 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 and control systems on the International Space Station. Um, so really without it, uh, the, United, the, the, the ISS as a spacecraft technically would kind of be uh, in a bind. Um, again, this is not me saying that anything is going to change, but I do think that it is a good idea to at least kind of start that conversation, um, you know, to have in the back of our mind, hey, what would happen? How, how can we how can we become a little more uh, interdependent um, just from the you know, United States upper, um, my oral section of the... In advance there. Yeah, no, go ahead. Yep. There we go. There's uh, the International Beautiful. Station. And then you were talking about... Now everyone's going to see my share screen thing. <laughs> Uh, you, were talking, <laughs> yeah, you were talking about um, the Zari. Wait, which one were you talking about? I'm sorry, I missed that. I was talking about Zvezda for Zvezda. GMC. So Zvezda is the one right here in the back. If you can see my uh, mouse moving around, so we can zoom in here. This big module, not this piece here, but this section minus that piece there. That's another module in front of it. Um, and then, of course, the second oldest module. Sorry, the third. Sorry, that's the, that's the third oldest module of the whole space station, but the oldest module is Zarya, which is this one right here. So anyway, so there's that. Keep going. Sorry about that. Well, no, I, I you know, I think I think the only thing really that the only thing more to add is, like I said, because, you know, anytime a, a, an orbital correctioning maneuver needs to take place, it is done with these VESDA service module. So I do think that at some point it is a good idea, at least, to consider alternative options. Um, there's, there's been a ton of wild ideas kind of thrown around. We've seen even a rumor, um, with Cargo Dragon XL. Oh yeah. Possibly, uh, you, you know, so I, and, and I, I mean, I don't know the viability of that or not, uh, considering the spacecraft for all I know is still, you know, paper spacecraft at this point. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's, it's hard, it's hard to tell, but you know, I, I, I don't think, uh, I don't think station is in any kind of immediate position no. to, to. You know. And honestly, I think the more likely thing is something critical is going to happen with the Russian segment before Russia even has the ability to move to another space station. Um, I think you're right. Now, whether that happens in 2024 or 2028 or never, I, I don't. I think it's uh, who, nobody really knows. So there are some cracks already forming in the uh, Z uh, the uh, Zvezda, sorry, yeah, Zvezda module, and I think there's also some cracks starting to form in the Zarya module on the on the on the hull. So things to be. Mindly concerned about, but 
um, there, there is a, the, the leak in particular on the Zvezda module is slow but manageable. And actually, it's in a particular part that they can actually close off the hatch to. It's actually in the very back of, this, of, the, of that module. And uh, the only thing that would go beyond that is either space or another spacecraft. They usually just park a progress cargo ship there. And then uh, they just keep that little small little section um, closed off. So they just, if they need to repressurize it for some reason, they can easily do that. So um, going on to what we were talking about, though, um, eventually Russia does want to build their own space station. I'm hoping that I can actually pause this. I don't think I ever actually paused it. I'm going to go ahead and show, pull up the Roscosmos page over their space station here. You can kind of see, let's see if I can, I don't want to, yeah, it's not going to work. Yeah, there's some, deep, there's some weirdness going on when it comes to uh, uh, an American um, internet connection trying to connect to a Roscosmos website. So I'll, there you go. Yeah, so if I hit refresh, I may not get it back again. So I had to actually go through a VPN to get this for some strange reason. This is the initial configuration they want to get to by or at least start building in 2028. I'm trying to remember all the particulars of this one here. Let's see if I can go find it on another on another thing here. Um, one of them is, you'll notice this, oh, sorry, I'm gonna keep hitting back and forth here. I wonder if I can just hit uh, new tab, see if that works. Yeah, I don't know if it's gonna work or not. You might just, you'll just see a slideshow for now. Um, those that those particular modules there. I think the the main one that they're going to launch first. I think it's this one right here. I'm trying to remember the name of it now. Um, oh goodness, bear with me here. They actually want to launch it into a polar orbit. Um, I think either uh, around 96 degrees or something like that. Basically, what that would do is you know take it around all of Russia so they can see everything. They claim that it's going to be better for them scientifically and. Uh, whatever th they want to use it for. They've claimed that they've run out of you know, science experiments there that they want to do on the International Space Station. I personally think they just don't have the money to run the science experiments up there. But that's, right. pers that's personal opinion. Don't take that as fact. But they uh, want to have it at about 340 kilometers or so. So it's roughly the same altitude as the International Space Station, just in a different inclination. The ISS is at, what, 51.6 degrees. This will be inclined to basically a polar orbit. Um, and trying to figure out the first module that's going to be launched. Give me a second here. Um, I always hate giving, uh, putting silence on air, especially when I'm looking for things. It doesn't help that I'm looking for it too. You're looking so. for it too. <laughs> I was this whole time. I had this in my head earlier. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> If anybody in the comments knows uh, or chat knows, let me know. Oh, gosh. Anyway, it's called the Russian Orbital Space Station, or ROS. I'm sure they'll come up with another name for it later, and probably near to. It's just a guess. Who knows? Um, it kind of reminds me of some of the old near to designs. But the first one, it's the first one launched. It's either going to be this piece here or this piece, but one that looks like that. And it'll have, you know, your basic, you know, initial orbital, uh, orbital, uh, uh, attitude control, propulsion, all that stuff. Also crew cabins, life support, etc. Then they'll launch this little ball thing here, which will be pretty much the same design as the pre-chow module that currently re a lot that recently made it to the space station. So that'll be the docking node that they just replace all these modules on when they get old, I guess. And then they'll have a science module that launches and docks to the other side and then an airlock module. And that's the initial configuration. After that, they plan on adding aspirationally, of course, a bunch of other modules for on-orbit servicing and a few other things. Uh, I'm trying to remember all the particulars about that. But it, it kind of reminds me of the uh, Mir space station back in the day when they started launching the Mir space station in 1986. They had these plans for it, but at the, after the fall of the Soviet Union in particular, they pretty much stopped it. It, looked, it was basically a T shape for a while until we started the Russia uh, the uh, uh, shuttle Mir program in what was that 1992, I believe. No, no, it would have been 93. It was after the Clinton administration. 92 or 93. So, uh, and then of course that influx of cash um, helped out with build, building a few other modules. One of which I th think um, was owned by the United States, essentially, kind of like the, Z the Zarya module. I want to say that was the. Uh, why am I drawing a blank on the name of the module? 
the one that was ultimately had the uh, progress collide into it. I think that was actually U.S. owned. Do you know what I'm talking about? Good question. Yeah, I do. Yeah. So anyway, so that's what it's looking. Let's see. Um, Ziggy said, uh, "Hey, a surprise Ziggy arrived. Welcome, Ziggy." Think Russia came full <laughs> circle with their station design. Yeah, yeah Spectre. Thank you, Ziggy. So Spectre uh, yeah. was U.S. owned. But yeah, if they can get this built, it, it'll be great. But at least for them, and at least. Um, but I, you know, again, show me the money. I don't. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, it won't be finished. It won't even start by 2028. I can promise you that. I mean, I'll, I'll pretty much eat this hat that I'm wearing if that if that happens. I, I'm right there with yeah. you, man. I, I just I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I and and you know, prove me wrong, I guess. Yeah, I uh, but. More space stations is better, but I also, you know, at least right now, Russia's kind of uh, more on the military side of things. So I'm curious to know what they're going to ultimately be using it for other than, you know, know, national pride, which there's nothing wrong with that. But yeah. So anyway, that's what they want to do instead of join us, uh, join the United States on the Artemis program. Um, They're not going to be joining the Chinese space station because there's for a number of reasons, because the... uh, Space station is in a, the Chinese space station is in a different inclination than what the current Russian launch sites can get to, and uh, they're not going to hitch a ride in the Shenzhou at least not regularly, because <laughs> no. you know, they just got done letting the United States do that and talking about us and you know, hitching a ride all the time. Let's see, Ziggy said, uh, "Salyut went to Mir. Mir kind of uh, split the ISS and Tian uh, and Tiangong. The ROS on the ISS looks." Uh, like the expansion and Tiangong for the first. I'm trying to understand what you're saying there. Oh yes, yeah, so, Salyut basically formed Mir. If I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, Ziggy, Mir kind of split to the ISS. Yep, Mir. Yeah, um, the piece of the legacy of Mir was on the Russian side of the space. Ultimately, when it ended up being put into the Russian side of the International Space Station. And Tiangong kind of looks like a like, happy medium between Russian design and U.S. design. It's kind of neat. Um, yeah. So he says, uh, this station is the ultimate Russian station design coming in all. Yeah, I can, I can kind of see that. It is definitely an evolution of on Russian station design concepts because every other station to date, if I go back to the, you know, this, all these other modules, uh, the big ones anyway, so, you know, Zarya, Naoka, and uh, Zvezda are all Soviet heritage. Uh, this yeah. the uh, Zvezda module is based on the same heritage of Salyut, uh, the first the first space station, and then the uh, uh, Zarya module, as well as the uh, Naoka module, all based off of uh, the TKS cargo ship design they had uh, before the Mir space station. They just modified that and made uh, uh, extra modules for um, for Mir. So it's it really is Mir heritage and Sal- uh, Salyut heritage. It is, in many ways, from, from a history standpoint, quite beautiful, and. Um, not to be too, you know, oddly romantic about it, but <laughs> but you know, going back to this, this kind of it's definitely these are the first new, des- real new designs in the Russian space program. Whether they can actually, you know, get them built at a reasonable time, again, we'll see. That's the question. Yeah. So, I'm trying to figure out if there's anything else to add, and I'm going to turn that off so we can see that again. Um, anything else you want to add? No, I just think that it really does kind of give, uh, again, at least open up the conversation um, for the commercial sector um, and its opportunities to potentially either get involved with with the orbiting outpost or, um, you know, we've seen concepts all over the place for, you know, privatized space Mm -hmm. stations. What does that look like uh, beyond 2030? Don't really know, honestly. Uh, I I think it's it's, uh, up in the air, no pun intended, really. but uh, it's it definitely I does it does get you thinking you know yep. what what can we do? No, so. yeah. So we got either way. Let's say they do get it accomplished in, even by twenty thirty. That means we're going to have possibly the International Space Station flying. Because honestly, I still think it's going to fly a couple of years after twenty thirty, assuming everything is still safe to fly. Um, yeah. So we have the International Space Station. We'll have the Chinese Space Station. Um, we'll have possibly the beginnings of this Russian Space Station, plus. As many as three commercial space stations, uh, one of which being started on the International Space Station. And yeah. That's just all in low Earth orbit. That doesn't even count the Lunar Gateway and the moon's orbit. So we're going to have a lot of space stations in the coming years, assuming nothing completely, you know, 
collapses or crashes. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, I think the more space stations, the better, uh, you know, especially for, for scientific advancement, you know, and, and when we talk about space and international cooperation, it is kind of a, a bit of a political equalizer. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if, if we can, if we can, if other countries are, are making more advancements, um, especially from a scientific standpoint and experimentation or anything like that, um, that maybe we didn't think of, maybe Russia didn't think of, maybe China didn't think of, you know, that's, that's more power to, to them, I say. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah. So I'm trying to think if there's anything else we missed on that topic, other than just kind of talking about the Russian space station, it's not a whole lot of details out there. I mean, I can give you design uh, specs on sizes and all that stuff, but each of the big modules are about the same size as the current big modules on the space state on the international space station. So no. it's not going to be like a giant space station. It's going to be probably closer to the size of the Chinese space station when it's when all said and done. The International Space Station is huge. <laughs> possibly, <laughs> it is possibly larger than it needs to be, but it's also like three or four different space stations put into one. You know, you got the uh, module for the Columbus module, which is a, 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 from the European side of things that they wanted to build their own little Columbus station. The Japanese modules are uh, basically a you know same idea you know they had their own space station design concepts that they wanted to put on space station freedom our stuff is all you know from space station freedom back in 1984 when that was first announced and of course the russian side you know was the same from year two and all just put it into one so yeah. quite quite interesting it's going to be historically very fascinating to talk about from a design standpoint architectural history part side of things absolutely yeah. <laughs> but yeah it's there's a lot cool about the ISS when it comes to like how all that ends up working out. It yeah. was a long road to get to the ISS and it's going to be sad when it's all gone. It is. Yeah. And like you said, I, I do, I do hope that everything's able to, you know, to safely operate, um, 20, 30 and beyond. I really do. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's great to have a continuous presence, um, on board the station, especially, you know, for the last almost 21 years now, um, you know, 22 years, 22 years well, coming, coming up, up now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For any of you watching that are under 22 years old or 21 and so many months, <laughs> never yeah. <laughs> without people in space. And it's just crazy. So, yeah. And it's, it's, that, it's... that number's only going up too. One side, yeah. complete side note, we got seven people on the International Space Station, which that number also could go up once you get the Axiom modules going up there. Yeah. And then you have the Chinese Space Station, which during indirect handovers could have as many as or during direct handovers could have as many as six people on the Tiangong space station uh, so you could have relatively soon as early as really this December we could actually set a new simultaneous people in orbit record on orbit record record yeah, yeah. right now that record is 13. Uh, now there have been more than that in space at the same time if you I think uh, if you count the suborbital missions that go up every once in a while <laughs> Uh, so briefly, yeah, yeah, sure. it's just more people in space. I think Blue Origins uh, suborbital rocket can hold six people, and I think eight people total if you count if you count the pilot yeah. co-pilot for Virgin Galactic. So I get people counting Good those. Point. I don't count those when it comes to that stat. Eh, it's not that interesting to me. I mean, it's great that they're doing it, but you know, yeah, but honestly, it depends somebody, on how you view it. I suppose if somebody offered me a, offered me a trip, I would probably take it. So I shouldn't complain too much. <laughs> and then I'd probably say that I had been into space. That's so, you know, it's hard for me to, to argue otherwise. You know? yeah. <laughs> so um, I might briefly talk about this because uh, this next topic, unless there's anything else. Oh, hang on. Ziggy said something here. Um, guess what I found. What did you find, Ziggy? Um, don't want to hold off too long here. Well, with a knife. Yeah. Can you see the chat, by the way, Colin? You know, I actually can't. Oh. Uh, but you know, I was, I was, I was kind of well troubleshooting as I go here. Yeah. No, I'll keep going, and um, if he says something, too, I'll, if he says something out, I'll, I'll, I'll announce it. Oh, it says, remember the last time cool. with the Astro trading cards? Oh yeah, you were talking about that. Was that on Discord? We were talking about that, about having astronaut trading cards. And I think my thing was uh, that that sounds cool until you have deal with you know selling somebody's likeness which you can't do that in the u.s so, yeah yeah <laughs> without their permission at least so. i like the idea of spacecraft trading cards that's cool that's a cool thing yeah you know there's a lot of spacecraft if you don't count human spacecraft you know i was gonna <laughs> you say you know it's you know satellites normal or sure sure so um 
trying to think here. I'm going to briefly go into this next topic here, unless you want to add anything to the next topic. Just kind of a uh, switching gears to the Artemis program again. We got Artemis 1 coming up this month, which that's getting scary close. It's getting really real now. Um, Very real. But they're already looking toward the next Artemis mission, obviously, which is Artemis 2, of course. Um, they're looking at making the, the delivering the core module, the big core state, the big orange part of the rocket, to the Kennedy Space Center as early as next spring, possibly, I'll just say the first half of next year, and this is actually yeah. based on reporting from nasaspaceflight.com, so I don't want to go too much into it because I don't want to step on their shoes because they did the reporting, it's great stuff, you can go find, go to nasaspaceflight.com and they've actually got a really good article about it, but if there's anything else you wanted to add about the new, the next core stage after Artemis 1 coming up to the Kennedy is less than a year, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. It really is. They're they're doing some really good work good work down there at uh, Mishu Assembly Facility in New Orleans. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's um, that production's ramping up, and it's great to see. Uh, you know, and and this is really kind of you know, again, I, I've I, I said it last week, I said it the week before, and I'm going to say it again. You know, we've we've stared at concepts for the better part of ten years now. Um, so to to see the hardware actually being built and delivered here at the Kennedy Space Center is just something else. Mm -hmm. It's it's really. Um, it's unbelievable. It's, it really is. It's, it's hard to believe. And, and just like you said, you know, we are, uh, um, really 30, 29 days away almost at this point from the, uh, so the first true. attempt so possibly. So, so <laughs> there's a lot that needs to happen. Uh, yeah, there really is. Oh, and gosh, now but, the uh, core stage for Artemis two won't have to go through the same hurdles that the core stage for Artemis one. Did. No, no. So and, and I, no, that I, I to Kennedy. Yeah, and they can they can basically do all the checkouts that that need to be done um, there at at uh, at MAF. That's 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 part of it. It's going to go there um, directly directly, like you said, to, to the Kennedy Space Center. We're not going to undergo that uh, green room testing like we saw uh, with the first core stage. Um, so you know we won't we won't see it. Uh, at least I don't believe we're going to see it over at Stennis. Um, that's should, not good uh, yeah, I mean, anything could happen at this yeah. point, but uh, the plan is not to take it to Stennis Space Center at this point for green run testing. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you want to go into the next topic unless you wanted to uh, elaborate more? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, again, you know, we're, we're talking we're talking more about SLS and the Artemis program, um, and NASA is really doing its best to solidify um, the operational status of SLS and Artemis. So what we are seeing now um, is – sort of a, a, a call for a services contract. So basically what we're doing and what NASA is doing is it's moving. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so NASA did release a, press, a presser uh, not too long ago. I believe this was just a few days ago. Um, so basically what we're, what we're doing and what NASA is doing is they're taking SLS rocket uh, basically from the design stage to the operational stage. And what they're going to be doing is they're going to be switching to a single source contract provider this is not something that NASA is unfamiliar with. We saw this back in uh, 1995, 1996, in the space shuttle program um, with the creation of the United Space Alliance. Uh, of course, that was a uh, joint cooperation uh, between Lockheed Martin and Rockwell um, that really kind of oversaw the operational um, status of space shuttle. This is kind of uh, moving towards the same thing with SLS. This is really um, just about guaranteeing flights for SLS until 2050. <laughs> um, with the, the, the caveat of, uh, of, of one cargo mission a year. Um, so this, to me, this is really exciting. I think this is, uh, this is something that's, that's exactly what NASA was kind of, it, this, this really has been in the works for the better part of nine months now, um, to, to, to bring SLS up to operational status. Um, so, uh, of course I, I invite you to read that the, uh, the press release there, uh, there is some, some pretty good information there and, um, yeah, it's 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 good to to see it again. Kind of a hopefully hopefully a decent operational cadence that we're going to see uh, with the SLS rocket. Yeah, and I think for at least for moon missions, this basically again anything could happen in terms of funding. Things could still be canceled down the road or switch up hardware. You know, that's we're talking 10, 12, 12 years, thirteen, probably even fifteen years from now before we get to some of this these numbers. Yeah. But, um, we're, you know, there, this for the human missions, I believe it's through Artemis 14, if I recall correctly. Yeah, Artemis 14. Yeah, and then of course, starting at some point in the later half, latter half of the decade, you have the cargo missions. Now, these cargo missions could possibly also send, you know, spacecraft into deep space missions, like to uh, Neptune, possibly. I know there's a, is it Neptune or Uranus? They're talking about sending something. It was Neptune, I believe. Yeah. There were 
Yeah. There are more than there's more than one way to get out, get to the outer solar system. But the problem with the outer solar system, it's so darn far away. The bigger your rocket, the more thrust you can give it initially, the better. And so that's why yeah. for these uh, uh, deep space, these super far out there, the outer solar system missions, if you don't want to wait 15, 12, oh, almost 20 years to get your spacecraft to the destination, you kind of need a big rocket like Space Launch System to propel it out that far. I mean, you, there's other big rockets out there, too, that might be able to do the job as well. You know, obviously, the easiest one that comes to mind is Starship. But, you know, it'll be interesting seeing how Starship design and SLS contracting kind of work with each other and how things evolve in the latter half of the decade yeah you know you know you talked about you know getting sls through 2050 essentially which you know barring anything from starship or congress or anything like that happened that's essentially what this would allow but things do change you know i think before the columbia accident they were talking about flying the space shuttle to 2020 they were so, yeah so who knows and if, but it is really neat to see this happen it, it might make it a little more affordable um and everybody talks about cost this let me go into a quick tangent real quick. Everybody talks about cost about SLS, and it is expensive, no question about that. It's expensive plus one a year. But let's look at a, the idea of one moon landing under the Artemis program. One moon landing under the Artemis program is going to get us six days on the, on the lunar surface. So six days out of the year. The peak of the Apollo program was essentially the same thing. So if you think about human days on the moon, so I think it was like about two Apollo missions a year. I think one year they had three, but on average it's about two a year. And uh, the latter missions in particular were three days each. So <laughs> you're getting essentially yeah. the same thing for one mission for the cost of, of probably two Apollo missions. So I don't know. Just a little soapbox there if anybody's <laughs> – if anybody agrees with me, yeah. I don't know. But I just thought that was kind of neat to mention. We're only getting one moon mission a year, possibly more, but probably one. But we're getting a lot for that one mission. So. Well, it's all about sustainability this time, yes. right? You know, this is this is not a politically driven program. Yeah. You know, this this is sustainable science long into the future, hopefully. Um, you know, I mean, this is this this really is kind of the the, 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 the initial, dawn of a new era. The six days is for the initial. Sure. Run, so. Sure. But, yeah. Well, exactly, and that that kind of builds to my point of you know where we're. we're we learned how to live and we learned how to work in space um, with the International Space Station, but we really um, want to learn how to do that on a, another orbital body that isn't, you know, in low Earth orbit. So, you know, if, if we can, you know, establish the same long term human presence that we had in low Earth orbit on, say, the moon, that speaks volumes, I think. Uh, you know, I just I, I think at least around the moon with Gateway. Yeah. Exactly. Um, which, unless you've got nothing else to add to this, Derek, I think kind of segues beautifully into our uh, next topic. Well, actually, I was going to talk about the Long March 5B, but we could go. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Unless you want to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, you can talk about Long March. I could talk about Gateway. Uh, yeah, no, that's that's great. Yeah, whatever whatever, whatever you want to do. That sounds great. Got My it. apologies. No, I no, totally no, that's fine. It would have said the thing backwards. backwards. <laughs> we could do it. We could do it. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the gateway then, since it does segue perfectly. Sure, sure, I'm go for it. The segue already. Go for Sorry, it. Sorry, guys. Anyway, so <laughs> one thing, we, the Lunar Gateway, we kind of talk about that a lot. The first two modules, and again, for those who aren't familiar, the Lunar Gateway is a small, I emphasize small, space station that they're going to be putting in a, for lack of a better phrase, highly elliptical orbit around the moon. It's not really in orbit around the moon. It's actually in, uh, in orbit between the Earth and the moon using a, a gravitational balancing point. Uh, but it's called a near rectilinear halo orbit that it's going to be around, and that's going to be a spot that we can actually rendezvous astronauts and hardware, and it's kind of a way station before going down to the moon. Orion actually can't get to low lunar orbit with the way it's designed. That's part of the reason why it's up there. But also, that orbit allows for other um, countries or organizations easy access to the gateway, because it's, I think, it, not humans, obviously, but for cargo, I think there's it's relatively, I say relatively, relatively easy to get to from a uh, cargo standpoint, as long as you don't have to worry about time. <laughs> um, so, and then, so you can send a lot of things there. And of course you could potentially use that whole area as a starting point for a Mars mission. But going to that, this gateway is gonna start off with two pieces, the power and propulsion element and the habitation and logistics outpost module or halo module. Those will both be launching at the same time atop the Falcon Heavy, but NASA recently released this neat little animation, which I'll pull up here. 
um, a little animation about the gateway because there's going to be a few other modules being built as well. Uh, you got uh, an international habitation module, which will be launched atop a space launch system rocket along with, or co-manifested, co I should say, with um, a, an Orion crew. So it'll be kind of like bringing, like the old days when they brought the Apollo uh, command module. Oh my, wow, words. And then the lunar module where they would, un <laughs> <laughs> I know words. <laughs> Um, when they would uh, jettison the Apollo command module away from the Saturn V and then do the, what was the transposition and docking where they basically do an about face and go dock to the lunar module, which is still attached to the upper stage of the Saturn V. The same idea, only with an actual module for a small, for a small space station. So anyway, here's the gateway build up here. I'll just talk through it. There's no sound. So you got the initial two modules here, um, PPE and Halo. Then you got the habitation logistics outpost. You can see Orion bringing it. The, the, sorry, the international habitation module. You can see Orion bringing it there. And then after that, you'll have a cargo mission that'll bring a robotic arm, the Canadian robotic arm or Canada Arm Three, third generation robotic arm from Canada. So that'll go on to the bulk of the space station. And that, and that cargo ship's probably based off the Dragon XL design cargo ship. We have just. A, I'm going to pause real quick here. So you have the cargo ship based off of a design that SpaceX is working on, Dragon XL. And then you have, this is just a government reference mission for a lunar lander. What would it probably go here is either... Um, might be a starship? Might be a starship, which would take up <laughs> a lot of space in this in this view. So, it, yeah, it, starship is very big compared to all this. Yeah, <laughs> I, just a bit. Yeah, starship is huge. But I, uh, or you could have an, uh, potentially one of the other landers as well. There's going to be a second yeah. lander, whether it's from um, Blue Origin or uh, possibly uh, um, Draper Technology. Is it Draper yeah. Technologies? Uh, uh, is it Draper? Dynetics. I'm sorry. Not Draper. Dynetics. Dynetics. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry I... about that, guys. <laughs> uh, Dynetics. It's been a long week. It's, it's, yeah. Dynetics has got a nice little small little lander that I think makes more sense for what NASA is wanting to do. But SpaceX has got that huge lander that makes sense for large amounts of cargo. I kind of want them to team up, you know. Just depends on I would love to see that. We'll see what is yeah. happening. They got, there's a lot of work to do before we get to that point. But either way, a lunar lander would dock here for the crew to get into the transit and go down to the moon. And so they kind of show that a little bit here. Um, so after that gets there, the cargo ship would probably undock. No, sorry. The, another module comes, and it's the... Uh, if you read here, it's the European System Providing Refueling Infrastructure and Telecommunications cool. Refueler Module, or eSprite RM, to the Gateway. And uh, based on what I understand, that's just basically a module that's going to have, as it says, extra fuel, some more communications. That fuel will provide, um, will mostly be used to uh, keep the power and propulsion element fueled. I think it's got, is it going to be Xenon? For the uh, ion propulsion, so. and of course, yeah. some, yeah. some uh, probably some standard thrusters as well for standard station keeping. So that'll be the second major module to be added. So you see, you got the two first initial ones. So the first addition is the international habitation module, and then you have the e sprite module here. And after that leaves, actually, at that point, they'll do their lunar mission. This is probably Artemis Five, mm -hmm. and then they'll come back. Artemis Five will depart. So we're talking later in the decade at this point, the late 20s. And then uh, the lunar module will depart or something else will happen with it. And then the cargo ship will depart because it's not a reusable cargo ship. Probably crash it into the moon. Who knows? Yeah. And then another mission, a cargo mission will come up. And then we'll have Another lunar lander docked at this port. I don't know why they chose the ports, but it's just a reference, a reference yeah. animation anyway. Shows viability, I guess, with mm -hmm. the different ports. And then we have an airlock module, which, side note on the airlock module, it was originally supposed to be built by Russia, but that's not happening now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think NASA is going to be choosing, a within the next few months, a, a an organization or country to build the airlock module for the gateway. It's, I wouldn't be surprised if it's, say, Japan, if Japan builds it. Yeah. Or uh, yeah. we'll do that would make another sense. option. Um, I don't know. Japan seems lo logical to me, but who knows? Could be somebody else. Yeah. So going on here. So they'll take the airlock module. This is Artemis, what, six? 
and then they'll go down to the moon and yeah. come back. And then they go back home. Kind of reminds me of the old space station animation they used to have. Yeah, it does. Different. And we basically start the process over again. Yeah. For the next mission. Another cargo mission, another lunar lander, and then another Orion star, Artemis 8, essentially, or whatever they want to do. That's basically it. So that's what the gateway will hopefully look like at the end of the decade. So, and It's pretty for exciting. Size, for size comparison, this is not very big. Um, that module here, this, if you, you know, might go backward, but basically these standard modules they're using are only about the size of the current Cygnus module that is being that is servicing the International Space Station. So the volume of this is what maybe one or two of the maybe the Destiny module and the Kibo module of the International Space Station combined and that's Oh, at best. At yeah, best. yeah. That might still be pushing. It might just be the Kibo module essentially vol same volume there. So it's not very big, but it's enough to get the job done. Sleeping quarters. Yeah. You can. Um, one of the things NASA's talked about doing with the gateway is actually having a mock mission to Mars uh, to kind of show, you know, yeah. rather than doing an an, an, uh, an analog on Earth, you could potentially be, do an analog on the Moon. So you can imagine an Orion spacecraft launching four people to the gateway. They stay at the gateway for six months and gradually increase their time delay for communications. Then they land on the moon, stay there for, it could be any amount of time. It doesn't really matter at this point, a week or a month, whatever the infrastructure is on the ground. Sure. Then they come back and stay at the gateway for another six months, gradually decreasing their time delay for communications. And the best thing about that is if something goes wrong, they can say, well, it's an emergency. Let's go back to near real time communication. <laughs> um, exactly. Exactly. But proving out all those things, I could see a mock Mars mission in the early 30s before we actually send people to Mars. You could also use that the gateway as a staging point for um, an actual Mars transport vehicle. Mm -hmm. you know? Lot, yeah. Lots of possibilities, but lots of uh, lots lots of question marks still. But that's part of the reason why we're doing the Artemis program is so we can understand what we need sure. to do to go to Mars. Okay. Absolutely, it's a great test bed. Yeah, I think that's it on that. Uh, do you want to add anything else? Nope, I think uh, I think that's uh, you know animation is, is pretty self-explanatory. It's pretty exciting. Uh, you know, this is obviously kind of the first time we've really had an orbiting outpost uh, on. on I say kind of the first time. This is, is the first time that we've yeah. ever had an orbiting outpost on another planetary body. So it's very exciting, and like you said, it just it does it does provide a, a nice test bed and proof of concept um, for maybe some future missions. Um, yeah. You know, it, it'll be exciting to see um, kind of what the the later part of the decade mm -hmm. uh, will bring. Okay, and the only thing else we got to talk about now is uh, the um, Chinese space station. Uh, oh, sorry, the um, Long March Five B core module, not core module, core stage for the rocket that launched the recent module to the Chinese space station. Yeah, so, yeah. the uh, the giant hurtling elephant in the room, I guess, yes. uh, as it was for for the past week. Uh, you know, definitely making headlines. I think uh, you, you know, I, I think when whenever whenever you have something that's uncontrolled. Uh, uncontrolled you know in, in orbit it, it definitely uh it gets people thinking that's for sure um so really you know what happened so china launched their long march 5b rocket um gosh i believe that was the uh, july 23rd it was 24th on, I, I, I don't remember i think it was sunday morning they launched it yeah last sunday. yeah um yeah last sunday um so so basically you know as as we we mentioned last time um their core stage does not it doesn't have a way to um, to control its landing where it ends up, um, and so basically, what happened was there was all kinds of predictions um, this past week of what would happen to it. Um, you know, obviously, astronomical societies were tracking its orbit. They found it? some. Uh, <laughs> where will it land? Yeah, uh, you know, who will be the the lucky the lucky winner? Um, and you know, I think I think it is important to note that obviously, whenever there's something. Um, of this size that's uncontrolled, yes, it is definitely a problem. Mm -hmm. It's definitely something that we should definitely be con concerned about. Uh, the likelihood of it actually impacting something, uh, you know, a, a populated area 
is an order of magnitude lower than you might think. Yeah. Um, the Earth is far and above more covered than water in water than anything else, uh, which of course is exactly what happened. Um, it did burn up, I believe, over the Indian Ocean. Um, yeah, was, I shouldn't course, say it burn up; it re-entered. Right, right over it, Malaysia, right. Yeah, Malaysia. Know. Yeah, it, it, it re-entered over over Malaysia. Yeah. Uh, of course, we we did see some video of that mm -hmm. uh, of that re-entry. I don't know. The large the pieces could have made it to land, but there's been no. Report yeah, on yeah. I mean, I don't know the extent to which it totally burnt up. Uh, to be completely honest with you, um, now, but I believe I believe the vast context, majority of it ended up in the Indian Ocean. For some context, though, it's not just a small rocket burning up, and oh no, we're worried about that. This is the <laughs> lar. It's a large, it's a large rocket module that makes it all the way into. It's big, orbit. yeah. The only other things uncontrolled that have landed, um, that have come in an uncontrolled fashion, uh, to the Earth, were would have been, I think, Skylab, obviously uncontrolled. Yeah. And although it was initially controlled, it wasn't at the end. Columbia. The yeah. Special of Columbia. Yeah. Uh, both of those were on about a hundred tons each. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other major uncontrolled reentry. Not of this size. Near, no, not not of this space size. Station, when they deorbited it, it was a controlled reentry. They did it over mm -hmm. the South Pacific Ocean. Yeah. This again, we're talking 22, 23 tons, uh, a large chunk of it, maybe, yeah. maybe 20, 30 percent that could make it through the atmosphere, slow down enough to not burn up, and then possibly land on things, whether it's tree limbs yeah. or the water or somebody's house or worse. So it's baffling to me that that was it's not a bug it's a feature for the Chinese uh, for that rocket it's it's they decided that they didn't care I guess because it would not be that much that harder to put a few retro rocket boosters on there everyone else does it everyone else uh, does I, it. I I yeah it's I, I it was you know supposed to deorbit but oh no we had an error it happens sure right now. <laughs> different different no, yeah. completely different yeah this 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 is um I, I don't. I don't want to call it a choice, but it, it, it it's. I mean, I don't have any pictures here, but you know, China's rockets often land in Chinese villages or near Chinese villages. It's sad. It's sad, and and that is not ice cream in there. It is some nasty stuff that that these things are filled with. Yeah. Um. So, so to see something like this uncontrolled, um, you know, uh, again, it it's it's pretty irresponsible. Um. You know, regardless of, of what what you might think, uh, to have something of this size uncontrolled, uh, again, it's one thing for for a one off anomaly. That's something totally different. This is yeah, like SpaceX's upper stage one time I think was not able to deorbit, and then at one point it pieces of it landed in uh, what Washington yeah. State. Although yeah, yeah, difference yeah. in size, but you know, much different. Yeah, much different. And of course, Starlink yeah. oh. uh, spacecraft are designed to completely burn up in the atmosphere. Yeah, allegedly, I and that's going to happen from time to time. You know, some 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 go out of orbit pr on purpose. Some just mm -hmm. fall out of the sky. But they, of course, like you said, they they burn up, and and that's that's really what they're designed yeah. to do. This is now, something. Uh, when the space shuttle launched, the uh, they actually purposely designed the space shuttle where the external tank did not make it all the way into orbit. Um, that the space shuttle itself had to give that final push into orbit at the uh, once it you know once they had the separated from the external tank. That way, the external tank would land safe or crash, re-enter safely in the middle of nowhere Indian Ocean. Um, the same thing is essentially going to happen with the space launch system. That core stage is going to actually, I think, it's going to have a relatively high apogee. <laughs> it, it will have a very high apogee. <laughs> I think it's going to go about a thousand kilometers up before it comes back down. Yeah. But, but it is designed to re-enter uh, re the atmosphere. Um, yeah. You know, again, probably around the Indian Ocean, somewhere around, thereabouts. But Orion will have to do that final job to push, or not Orion, to do the uh, uh, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, the upper stage ICPS, of SLS, yeah. will have to do the final job of pushing it into at least a stable parking orbit. So, why China decided not to do that, I I don't I don't know. I wasn't in the yeah. design review phase, so or the preliminary design review, but it yeah. obviously was a again, like you said, it was a choice. Not, yeah, not uh, doing it just a bash on China. I would say no, no. I, I think States, so. Again, I, I, I say everyone else does it. Mm -hmm. Why can't uh, you, you know? It's 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 just basic rocket design. Guys. That being said, that's, it did land harmlessly. This is the third their third yeah. rocket that they've done this with. There'll be another one in October. So heads up in October. Heads uh, up. Yep. 
um, but again, it's like playing the lottery. You know, every time you do it, you don't know where it's going to end up. You know, it's not. <laughs> yeah. The odds are low, but sometimes you're unlucky or. In the case of they're not zero. So they're not zero. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Anything else you want to add about this week? Uh, no, I think uh, I think that's about it. Um, I know you know it's it's not necessarily human space related, but uh, Tori tweeted some pictures of some engines. Oh. Yeah. Uh, which is which is pretty exciting. Flight one uh, is complete. Uh, um, for, uh, for for the Vulcan rocket, we should. You know, yeah, Vulcan that. Centaur, uh, the BE four engines uh, developed one. by Blue Origin. We can make that a small talk of, topic if you want. Uh, do you have your desktop? I can yeah. throw your desktop up. If you got pictures. Uh, Give me 10 seconds and I'll get you there. Now, the Vulcan rocket, is that first launch going to still be sending Astrobotic up? Or is it um, still up in the air about whether it's going to be in a, uh, just a dummy payload? I think Astrobotic is still on the uh, on the manifest, if I'm not now, mistaken. I don't, know how far along I don't think. Is on there, on there. I, I don't either. I mean, I know they I know they were significantly delayed. Um, I But I mean, I it does. I mean, what are they going to say? All right, let's just, let's just throw up a, a boilerplate. Uh, let me yeah. see if I can get this up here. Give me 10 seconds. It's probably going to ask me to do it first, so, but I'll once I get there. Stand by. Tell you what, let me just, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Stand by. Stand by. Like the Death Star getting ready to explode. I just got done watching uh, Light and Magic, that Disney Plus documentary on the Industrial Light and Magic. Yeah, highly, uh, highly recommend that one. That's that's pretty. Uh, I actually just sent it to you. Um, oh. I'm, I'm having a, I'm having a little. Yes, on the uh, the Facebook machine, I'm having a little bit of difficulty on my end. Yeah, we'll do it this way. There we go. And I'll just uh, send it on. There we go. There's there's the BE4 engines. Where are my engines, Jeff? Well, they're right there. So <laughs> they're right here. They're here finally. We have two engines. These are flight engines, correct? Yeah, these are, this is flight one. Uh, so they're going to be sending that up on the first Vulcan rocket launch, possibly later this year, maybe early next year. And it's going to be a yeah. methane-fueled engine. Well, not methane. Well, it's liquid methane. It's the same. Liquid natural gas. That's what it's going to be. So I'm, I'm not crazy saying that's the same thing, am I? No, you're not. Yeah, okay. So I'm making sure not sound like an idiot. <laughs> Wouldn't no. be the first person to sound like an idiot on the internet, I suppose. But um, Pretty easy to do these days. But what's cool about this is at least... As of last time I checked, the first launch of Vulcan was supposed to carry a mission for the Artemis program. The, the uh, one of the first, well, it said to the Artemis, it's the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, CLPS, and it was going to be sending a payload, uh, a lunar lander built by Astrobotics Technologies to the moon, and it's going to be the first, well, one of the first, uh, if not the first, a mission for the CLPS program. It's a lot of a lot of these precursor missions for the moon for science and. Uh, buying down risk and everything but it's yeah. really i'm really not sure how far along astrobotics is i know intuitive machines is also vying to be the one of the first ones as well which is another company so we're going to have possibly two lunar landings um on the moon in the first half of next year or early or late yeah. this year just again scheduling but yeah there's that and that's the uh, peregrine lander that, uh, that derek's lander. talking about um I don't. I don't. I, I. really, to be honest with you, I don't know how far along it is. Uh, it, it, I don't. I don't even remember really what the delay was. Um, well, they but, had, but that that really was a big a, thing. A, they the had delay. a press conference um, back in April, and they had all a lot of the hardware still in the clean room. Um, but I think last I checked, they're hoping to get it to Kennedy by the end of the year for processing. Yeah, so that'd be great. I'd and honestly, I'd love to see an operational mission for for Vulcan Centaur as its first thing. Mm -hmm. um, yep. You know, boilerplates are one thing, but yeah. it'd be great to you know see so, flexes muscles. I'm really excited for this project. Yeah. So. Okay. Anything else you want to add? Anything in the chat? Are we forgetting anything? And one other thing I want to mention was some breaking news this evening. Um, you probably already heard too, Colin, right? Um, Michelle Nichols of uh, Star Trek. Uh, who played oh yeah, she, yeah. She died today, or either today or yesterday. But the announcement was today. I'm not sure when exactly it, it happened. Yeah. But died of natural causes 80, at the age of 89. Very influential woman. Um, obviously, very key figure in Star Trek and the history of television, really. And um, she was also, also the very, space program in general. Space program she in was general as well. The, she was very inspired. Yeah. She had practically inspired the diversity of the first uh, spatial astronaut class. 
So yeah. she does a lot of work to just, you know, tell you know, people of color and women, hey, NASA's looking for you. And because yeah. so far, people just assumed, you know, they're only looking for men. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ziggy, live long and prosper yeah. to Michelle Nichols. So I figured I should at least point that out, you know. Uh, sad. Um, she was 89. I think there are only yeah, just, just an awesome individual, like you yeah. said, just, uh, you know, just so influential to, to so many, so many kids across the United yeah. States. And, and like you said, just inspiring the diversity uh, mm-hmm. in the space program. It's just, just, just a really cool individual. So. I think there are only two members of the original cast left. I think it's sad. Um, uh, um, wow, I'm drawing a name. A blank on you name. got me. Uh, <laughs> William Shatner, gosh, I, I know this, yeah. guys, I promise. William Shatner and uh, George Takei. So, uh, Ziggy said, Ohara did a shuttle video in 77 and Orion won back when EM1 was still the name of Artemis 1. She did something for EM1. I forgot about that. I didn't know that. I, I didn't, I didn't know that send, she did. You can send a link either in the Discord or in chat, um, Ziggy, that'd be great. Yeah, that would be awesome. I would love to see that. That's, I had no idea. If it's, if it's not too long, we can just go ahead and play it. But if it's, uh, if it's short, um, or if it's too long, we'll just, I'll, we'll get in somewhere else on, or something. But yeah. Huh. Uh, before we uh, wrap up, if you, if I can play that video if you want, Ziggy, if you're able to get it up there. But for, first of all, I want to point out, I think it was uh, last week or two weeks ago, I forget when, I, forget, I forgot what live stream. There was a slight correct, I have a slight correction to make. I, we were talking, that yeah, was the first one. We were talking about the, uh, about the Bishop airlock and how it's the, uh, that initially progress is the only significant way of trash disposal for the ISS. I feel silly for making that mistake. I forgot completely about the Cygnus spacecraft, which also has a significant way to get trashed out of the ISS. So want to make that correction. And uh, yeah, got to be uh, responsible here. Don't want to tell anybody any lies. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to make, own up to your mistakes. So that was a, that was definitely yeah, an absolutely. error on Let's... my part. So I apologize. So. Um, See for the Michelle, let's see for the Michelle Orion uh, video. I'm not sure if he's going to send the link here or not. Although it's really a... let's see. We're getting up there on an hour. Yeah, for the uh, Ziggy for the uh, for the Orion video. If you find that. We might just put it in Discord too, because I might wrap this up relatively soon. Sure. So, well, before I do wrap it up, oh, it's not sending. It, it might not send because of the link. So just go ahead and put it in Discord, and we'll talk about it later on Discord or something. But I would like to see that just personally. Thanks, Ziggy. Thank you, Ziggy. Yeah. Appreciate and if, it. If you're not on Discord, Colin, you can. I can send you a link or whatever. Yeah, sounds great. Okay, so I guess uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, uh, I guess this wasn't too short of a, uh, of a video. I, I figured it would probably be less than an hour, and I guess technically we are just under an hour. The last couple of weeks, it was about an hour and 15, hour and 20. But um, he said send it. Can't send it. I'm not sure what you're saying, buddy. Oh, oh I see. So anyway, um, the news this week, we, where am I at here? I lost my train of thought. So we had, we talked about the um, <laughs> the Russian exit but not exit we talked about artemis 2 we talked about the contracting for slos long march 5b lunar gateway i'm trying to think if there's anything else that happened we had some a new update on iss benefits but i figured there wasn't a whole lot of time to get into that because i haven't really had a chance to look into that it almost needs its own separate show it needs its own separate show nasa did release a bunch of new updated statistics about all the benefits of the international space station from a science standpoint what it's doing to help everybody on earth so we'll yeah maybe i'll talk about that in, in another video so what's up next for videos um i'm working on a capstone video i mentioned that earlier that should be out ideally on thursday or friday and then i'll be working on a video over the commercial lunar payload services and then we get into sls and orion and that stuff is coming up quick and let me know in the comments or in the chat where you guys plan on being for artemis one because that's going to be a big one you know colin i don't know where you're yeah. going to be i don't know where i'm going to be either uh that's right now but <laughs> yeah yeah i mean uh it, it's it's this uh you know they're <laughs> we're expecting like upwards of like a million people um which you know titusville is a very small area so um 
get there early, I guess. Uh, I don't want to give away my, my good spots, but uh, <laughs> yeah. sure everybody already knows them, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I know there's, there's ways to talk about how many people are actually going to be there. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's upward of a million people. But then again, yeah. I've been disappointed in I've been disappointed in that before. Um, like I thought there was going to be a lot yeah. of people for the Axiom space mission back in April, but barely anybody knew about it. Yeah, so, yeah. I imagine they'll know about this rocket, so we'll see. There's no people aboard, but just expect it to be busy, especially if you're down here. Yeah. So and drive safe. <laughs> don't don't do anything stupid. Yes, on the please drive safe. Please so, please drive safe. Okay, so anyway, well, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, lots had a number of space news today. Uh, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to say. Thank you, Colin, for joining me Thank yet you. again, third week in a row. This is great. I think it's going well. Let me know in the comments if you think it's going well or we need, would like us to improve something. And yeah, absolutely. Please let us know. And thanks for having me, as always. Yeah, uh, it's, it's been a great three weeks. Uh, I will so. say there will be a point where when I go down to Florida for SLS, we'll probably halt the live streams just because I'm going to be so busy. But who knows? Maybe it'll work out. Maybe we'll do an in-person live stream. So, wow! Imagine yeah, that. We won't have to uh, try to, you know, guess the spot yeah, on the screen here. We'll figure we it all out. But <laughs> but just expect around yeah. the time of Artemis one that there may not be some live streams on a Sunday, or yeah. who knows? Maybe we'll do an impromptu live stream. So yeah, so, but we are planning on a stream next week. If you're still available next week, I'm sure there'll be some the news. They're going to be talking about Artemis one at NASA. Um, at least two days of the week this week. Um, an overview of the mission and i think there's gonna be a few other things we're gonna talk about these are media press conferences but so yeah so just join us next week at uh, 8 30 eastern time 7 30 central um and uh 12 30 in the morning on next monday i guess or utc time so <laughs> so let's see as siggy said drive safe don't crash the ml1 launcher uh the crawler shouldn't be doing donuts don't drive <laughs> if the crawler did donuts i would you know what? We had bigger problems. Yeah. That, that yeah. Be, yeah. <laughs> wow. I have this great visual. Somebody, the, the guy who does that art on, uh, I think it's uh, uh, the Daily Hopper. He should do something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's Try a good idea. That's a good idea. Donuts. If you don't follow the Daily Hopper on Twitter, you should. He, he does some yeah. great. Strongly great, recommend Daily great, Hopper. Co uh, great uh, comic cartoon drawings. Yeah. Uh, he's very timely about a lot of the stuff, too. It's very funny. So, anyway. I'm just rambling on at this point. Thanks again for joining, and uh, until next time, at Astra.